Clock All right. I call this <laughs> committee of the whole meeting to order at 6 p.m. here in council chambers. Uh, we have no remote electronic attendance, correct? Correct. Correct. So we first start with our oath of office. Jesse Green. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor, Council. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce to you uh, for his swearing in, Jesse Green. Jesse uh, comes to us. Uh, he was born and raised in Andalusia and graduated from Rockridge High School. Is that correct? Correct. Right. Okay, good. Um, he is a proud member of the United States Army Reserves, and uh, so we're very proud of that fact. And he still serves to this day. He's an Illinois certified EMT basic, so we'll be sending him to a paramedic class here. Uh, in the very near future, and uh, and then after that, the Fire Academy. So um, he is joined this evening by his wife, Emily, um, his daughter, Lila, and his son, August, and his mother, Leah, and his father, Darren. And Mayor, I would right. be very thankful some. if you'd swear this young man yes. in so we could use him. once again and a welcome aboard. Um, you'll note in our next items of business there are a few appointments to Youth Commission and Project Management Team. Are there any other questions on the agenda? Mayor, just that the um, public art and place making presentation as noted has been postponed. Yep, we're postponing the public art and place making policy presentation. To July 3rd. We need a little more time for Mr. Vitas and for staff to weigh in on some of the items in, in it. So, have a full package. To July 13th. 13th, okay. Yeah. Our next 
our next meeting. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so now next up is a presentation on tax center, tax layer center funding requests. Mr. Mullen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Von Ives. Appreciate everybody um, giving us an audience here today, and um, we've got a few requests that we want to uh, run by everybody. And um, basically, you know, we've been shut down since March 12th uh, of 2020, and we've had no income. And so we've been depleting our reserves, and I don't know if you're familiar with our contract, when, we, when our money runs out, then we have to become supported by the city. So, you know, I'm thinking on this, it would be a logical thing to do if, if we've got some government money to try to get, put it back into the building. We drive economic impact and we could return it probably tenfold of what we're asking for. And we're asking for quite a bit less than most other communities are, um, but we're just, this is what we thought was practical. And um, uh, Janine made some copies of some of the correspondence back and forth. Let it, oh, you can read that at your own time. I don't need to read everything here, but. Um, there's basically um, I think four things that total that we put into this request. We, we have $6 million in capital improvement projects to do, but I didn't include any, any of those things. Um, we ju we've done a couple million dollars in the past year since while we've been shut down trying to improve the building, and um, our reserves will be down to about two point, or what did I say? 2.4, I want to say. 1.4 by September, depending on how our upcoming events do. And one of the things I was asking for was to try to get some money to restart. Originally, I'd asked for $500,000 when this first uh, became known to me back in March to try to get us open when we got to the restricted capacity uh, situation where we went, we're at 30 percent and then went to 60 percent uh, bridge phase and then. Um, before we can get to 100%. But since most of that time has passed, it's, um, it, then we're down, I'm thinking, we just dropped that down to 100,000. I have one out and bought a show, a show or two that are coming up just to get the building open. We've got a lot of employees that count on us. Count on us. We have you know hundreds of employees, all the downtown businesses that count on us. So we wanted to get going, so we've got something coming up on, on July 9th, the first show. And um, we just wanted to get, get started. So. It would be great if we could subsidize some of that cost it's going to take to, to get our employees back um, and pay, paying for them, keeping them on, and uh, running those events. Um, and then uh, the other uh, asks are for an outdoor uh, venue. Where we, we've got a, a vision of building. They did this in uh, Hoffman Estates, where the Sears Center, it's called the Now Center now. Uh, they've got a great venue. It's basically the same type of a footprint of, as what we're looking at, the space between us and the Radisson on John Deere Commons. Um, it's uh, uh, just an outdoor venue. I don't know if you've ever seen Tanglewood over in Bettendorf, but it's a stage. They play uh, bands on weekends. Um, it would give the hotels uh, something more that they can use for advertising and, and to lure people here and more for the downtown. Um, it would be a, a restaurant, probably open for lunch. We've talked with uh, Jeff Harris of Bass Street about operating it on, uh, along with us. And um, we could have it for prior to football games and hockey games and things like that. It would be a big hit. So um, I think it would really add to it, the, the riverfront element of downtown and the estimated uh, cost to build it. We had Bush Construction run some numbers, and it was like $1.4 million. We're hoping. We're hearing that we're going to get $750,000 from uh, the, the state uh, out of their money. Uh, Mike Halpin was working on that, and I, I haven't seen anything or heard a timeline on that, but it sounds like it's it's in that budget. So that would leave about $700,000 uh, balance that uh, we'd be asking for to put towards this, and it would generate you know a, a, a lot of additional income and revenues downtown. Um, and then, of course, our sports teams. Um, They've missed out on almost all of the funding that's gone around that nobody really took minor league sports into account. And these aren't, you know, uh, George Steinbrenner's with, you know, a gazillion dollars. Sorry. But, <laughs> but they're, they're guys that invest their own money. And, they, and, and when they lost this money, they lost their own money. And they have, every, you know, a lot of, 
their life savings invested in this. And football's lost two full seasons, hockey's lost one. And um, so if there's an opportunity to help, help them out, the pandemic, it's not their fault. They were doing well. And, and now uh, we're in jeopardy of keeping them here. And if we lose them, it would mean millions of dollars uh, in, in lost economic impact to the city. Um, there were studies done by, uh, if we asked Dave Harrell to plug it into his economic calculator and the numbers are in there, but um, it's, the, the, the economic impact is huge. And you know, to get combined, we're you know, based on the events that I've seen in, in the calculator, just in what other cities have calculated for arenas like ours for economic impact, we figured somewhere between um, 80 and 120 million in economic impact annually from our uh, events that we produce. But um, you know, a, part, a big part of that is our sports team. So um, the numbers are in their presentations that they're going to do in a second. But um, where's that? There's a clicker. The clicker. So we got, I got just some pictures here of, of what we, we had uh, an architect uh, You're over here. do some drawings. Yeah, you want to click at this one here. <laughs> so an architect just did some renderings of basically what it would look like. Uh, this is some fire pits so we could be open a longer portion of the year. Uh, uh, there's tables that can be moved depending on what type of event it is. We would do caterings out there for some of the things that we have in our venue. On the left side, you can see um, kind of a, a patio area on the left that we would do some events and uh, we do wedding receptions, and business meetings. And on the right is Bass Street Chop House where we would, eat, where Fridays used to be, when you, where you come out there, it's, um, we'd put, try to put a patio there and then to the right of that, restrooms that would be attached to the hotel. And um, it'd be something that we would try to, um, have just live music in the summer months on Fridays and Saturdays so it wouldn't compete with Bass Street Landing. And uh, basically just open for lunch, we'd have a video screen on it that uh, we could show sporting events or uh, concert videos or uh, maybe stream what's going on inside the arena if there's a hockey or football game. Um, we'd have to relocate like the sculpture that's out there. Um, but it, it's, it's, it'd be a really neat thing for downtown to try to be, bring people down here and, and I think it would be um, just a, a great way, a great use of the river. And then we're also talking about with Jeff Nelson, he's got um, a project to uh, try to widen the bike path and put it up on that berm that's there behind where that stage is along the river uh, to make it safer and wider and it goes along with his dock project. Um, so that would, we'd still have that coming out behind the facility so people could ride bikes along the river still. And then it would be fenced in um, just so we can control if there's uh, you know, beer coming in and out and just, what, just to secure it, but it would be open to the public for the most part, people could bring their pets down there and sit there and watch whatever we have going on. Um, the, one that, the one that they have in Hoffman Estates, they were projecting uh, $600,000 in income this year. Uh, it's really a big hit there. And they made like $400,000 during COVID. So uh, they're, it's really a hit in Hoffman Estates. So, that's something that really could, um, could benefit the community. And, um, it, you know, when the train comes in, it gives people something to do downtown. Uh, the hotels love it. Um, and uh, they could almost, it being, that one being right next to the Radisson almost gives it like a resort status or something, the next level up with the with entertainment venue right next to it. That's, that's part of the thing. Um, so, I'm going to let these guys talk, and then I'll just come back and wrap up at the end. And I'll take your questions then. Do you have any? Uh, this is Doug Bland. He's Doug flew up from uh, Texas today for this, and uh, he wants to talk about uh, things that he needs. Well, first of all, I want to thank everybody for uh, allowing us to come in here and talk. Um, since 2017, I've been working with Scott to move the team. Uh, you know, obviously. People who have lived here knew the steam wheelers were here for 10 years, uh, and then they went away for 10 years. And then uh, after several conversations with Scott, we were able to revitalize the franchise. Um, for the 2018 season was our first our first season uh, back. We, uh, we led the league in attendance. We broke all attendance figures when the team came back. We made the playoffs in our very first year. Um, we were profitable. Uh, local ownership, myself, I lived here the whole time. Um, and you can see the crowd that we had there. Um, it was 
anybody that was downtown during those times. I mean, you couldn't find a parking spot. Every restaurant was sold out. Every hotel was sold out. I mean, it was it was quite the scene to have football back in the Quad Cities after a 10-year layoff. Um, and we, we put a world-class team on the field, like I said, made it into the playoffs in the first year and, and uh, had really something really big to build upon. Uh, in 2019, we moved to the largest league in the whole United States of America. It became a full national franchise. So we went to the Indoor Football League um, with teams like the Arizona Rattlers, the uh, San Diego Strike Force, uh, teams from Boston, uh, Dallas. I mean, we became, uh, Quad Cities became on the same level of playing competition as those big major metropolitan cities. Um, we revitalized a couple of really unique um, Rivalries with the Iowa Barnstormers, which is kind of probably one of the biggest names in, in indoor football, and then the Green Bay Blizzard, uh, which used to be in the league when the bar when the uh, Steam Wars were here back in in the early 2000s. We did a lot of uh, community-based stuff. We worked with the Riverbend Food Bank and John Deere, and we uh, generated over 30,000 meals for the less fortunate um, here in, in the Quad City area uh, through some of the promotions we did on game nights. And again, it was another profitable season. We were, um, you know, operating on a, on a profit. Then good old 2020 came around. Um, timing couldn't have been any worse for us. Uh, how the sports business works, I don't know, you know, just to explain a little bit about, you only make money on your home games. And we have seven to eight home games, basically a year. Um, so at the end of that season, you've got a cough for money that you have to use from the last game in June all the way through to when you open the season back up in February or March. So all that money we used all season long or all off season to do all our planning, preparation, purchasing of everything to prepare for the 2020 season. Uh, we had our first training camp start on February 20th. You have all the expenses of flying in, all the players, everything that you have to do to prepare for that season, knowing that on, June, or on March 21st, we're gonna have that first home game and that starts to re refill your coffers. Well, on March 7th, we had our first road game, which even a worse uh, gut punch because on a road game, you have to pay for your flights, you have to pay for your hotels, you have to pay for everything. So we had that on March, on March 7th, had a blow away victory. Um, and we were, our team was really ranked in the top, top four in the whole league. We, we had a chance to win it all. Uh, then March 12th comes around, shuts down the whole country. Um, we literally had contracts with housing. We had to pay, I mean, we had so much stuff that it's just like you ramp everything up and then the, the rug was pulled out from underneath of us. Um, then October 16th, the league came to us and said, hey, we're gonna try to do it again in 2020, the 2021 season. Um, at that point, we essentially could not make any commitments to the league. Of the 16 teams in the league, there's 10, 10 of them that are playing right now, but they're, uh, they're doing it because they're in a state that allowed indoor gatherings at a limited capacity of time. And, and when, at that point, we, there's no way we could commit to that. So we had to file for dormancy for the 2021 season. So that's two years in a row, we've lost 100% of our revenue stream from our sponsorships, our season ticket holders, um, our game night promotions, everything we, we've lost for two complete seasons. And then uh, you know a little bit about our community impact. Whenever we have a home game, the week of our home games, we send our players out to the local schools they do autograph sessions. They, they engage with them out in the playgrounds. And, and then every school that we're at, they, they get free tickets to, for kids' tickets to come to the game because we know a kid can't come to a game by himself, so mom and dad are going to have to bring him along. So uh, it's a really neat thing that we do in the community um, and, and tied in with uh, some of the charities. Like I said, uh, we tied in a lot with John Deere and the, the other large um, employers here in town um, to, to work with them and, and try to build the, the brand and build the team. So now down to the basically the community impact. This study obviously is the numbers you guys see in the handout you did. Um, they did this through the Visit Quad City, hired a third party company to come in and, and do a study specifically for the, the steam wheelers. Um, generated uh, 425000 almost $426,000 in local taxes, 414 jobs directly and indirectly, and uh, $7.3 million in direct economic impact through all of our games, our training camps, our tryouts, everything that happens throughout a season. Uh, again, and some of the things we did with the 30,000 meals. Um, and, and one of the big things that people don't understand by having a professional sports franchise that's a national sports franchise is the quality of life and, and all the employers in town, it helps to attract new young talent to come work for your companies here because there's things to do on the weekends. There's stuff to a team to root for. And 
you know, when I came out of school, I moved to Southern California because I had all those neat things that I could have. And, you know, the companies like John Deere and, and the, the folks that are here that are looking for that young, good talent to come and move to the Quad Cities, without professional sports, it's just one more obstacle you're going to have to overcome because they're looking at things to do with their life when they get off of work. You know, and then the pride of community. I mean, when we made the playoffs on that first year, the the people came and met the bus that night. I mean, it's just uh, if you ever been to a Steamrollers game, it's it's just a really intense and a really fun thing for the whole family. And um, we have such a great pride in the community here. So uh, again, I just want to thank you here for uh, letting me show you. And there's uh, the other thing here. I guess obviously the money part of it. Unfortunately, we were not able to uh, um, obtain any PPP money whatsoever. Um, we were the business interruption uh, funds. We have not received one penny of support since March 12th of last year. Um, so all the bills that we basically had were some of the sponsors that had paid in advance. We, we burnt through all that. Um, we had some reserves. We had to refund season ticket holders because we've gone two seasons now without games. Um, and the impact of what it's had on us right there, the $217,000, is essentially what we need just bare bones to get the team on the field and make sure that, that we are going to be back um, flying the Quad City banner for the 2021 season. Or 2022 season, I'm sorry. And uh, so that, that's what I have there for my presentation. And afterwards, if you guys have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer anything. Thank, Thank you for your time. You. Thank you. I'll echo uh, Doug and Scott. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, present tonight. Um, something Doug kind of touched on that I think is important, and I think also to what Scott said, a big reason we've been missed. When you think of small businesses, you don't think of sports teams, really. Um, George Steinbrenner is he's not running a small business. We are. Um, at our largest, we have had 10 employees um, in our business office. Of course, we have our players, but they're out on the ice, getting the job done in the office. We've had uh, 10 people at our largest, currently two. It was one for a while. Um, and we are also a new business, uh, which really the group of small businesses that have been hit hardest by this pandemic. Uh, for a quick history, um, I know everybody here is probably aware that the Mallards were here for a very long time. Uh, they left in the 2017-2018 season, leaving a gap here in the sports scene. Um, John and Missy Dawson, who are here tonight, um, stepped up to the plate, bought a sports franchise, brought it here. So the logo changed, the name changed, the league changed. Uh, but we still had some problems we had to fix from the teams that were here before. We had to fix relationships with corporate partners. Um, some of those had been frayed over the years. We made that a priority. And we also wanted to make it very clear to the Quad Cities that we were their team. Uh, we did that in a number of ways engaging fans, being active, uh, like the Steam Wheelers, getting our guys out in the classes. And we also, in our first season, gave back $162,000 to local nonprofits. Not many minor league sports teams anywhere will do that, but we felt it was important that we showed the community that we were here for them. We built upon that the 2019-2020 season, more give back, more interaction. We grew as an organization and were, as Scott alluded to, improving. We were getting better. We were and are here to stay. But then 2020 happened. Um, you can see in the bottom right corner there some crazy jerseys on the ice. That was our Marvel superhero night on March 7th. Uh, they wore those jerseys during the game. We auctioned them off afterwards raising money for the SAU Dance Marathon. Picture next to that, that dog posing very nicely for the picture. Uh, that was our final game on March 8th. We were normal up until then. Two days later, March 10th, we had our kids club party. That's a ton of fun. And then three days later, uh, excuse me, two days after that, our season was suspended. It was back in that time where no one really knew what COVID was, but we knew we could not keep playing games. Three days later, our season was done. We have a 28 game home schedule and we missed our final six home games of that season. That's at a very tough time for us when a lot of our expenses have been recognized already. We're, we're coasting, we're down the home stretch. And then we did not get those final six games. Um, that was tough. We got some more tough news a few months later. Uh, the start got pushed back from October to December. We thought, hey, maybe there's a chance. 
And then October 6th, we were unfortunately uh, forced to come to grasp with the fact that we did not have a chance to play. Um, if we do not have between 2,000 and 3,000 people in the arena on a game night, we are in big trouble. And up until I think early February, we could have 50 people in the arena because of the protocols in the state of Illinois. That's not 50 fans. That's our, our team and our coaches and the opposing team and coaches. It was just not, not doable for us. But we did make the commitment from the get-go to stay active in the community, even if we did not know we would be playing. On the left, it's something that seems very normal now, but at the time, curbside was a foreign concept, so we made a menu for all our sponsors, telling people how they can patronize their businesses, hours, etc. Storm masks, radar, if you don't know them, you will soon, our mascot, very popular guy. We made some coloring sheets, and then we took radar out to the streets. Um, we started this right in the heat of the pandemic. Everybody had been in their house a long time. Kids were going crazy, parents were going crazy. We brought radar by to wait, just to say hello to the kids. And as you can see on the right, some big smiles. We thought this would be a one day thing. It turned into like a two week project. We went to over a hundred houses over the course of two weeks. And uh, I think gave parents a few minutes of reprieve and made a lot of Storm fans very happy. We did anything we could. Curbside trick-or-treating was very unique, but we did that. Uh, went and recognized some sports teams. There you see the U10 girls team that plays over at River's Edge. Did not get to have a ton of fans at their championship game that they won. We went to congratulate them and stay engaged, <coughs> excuse me, with the nonprofit organizations who we have maintained our relationships, uh, Salvation Army Kettlebell kickoff and the Big Brothers Big Sisters golf tournament. And if you don't believe Radar's popular, he's got Cinderella status on that birthday cake. And that was pretty impressive to me. I don't think this will play a PDF. No. Right? No problem. So the good news is that we are coming back. We had a big Friday a couple weeks ago. Uh, we went to Phase 5, which was, I'm sure, welcome for everybody in this room. We got to announce our opening night, October 15th, which we are very excited about. And... I'm a huge Doobie Brothers fan. The Tax Lawyer Center announced that they will be coming to town in August. That was all on one Friday. Great day. <laughs> it was like the first day, it's like, we are out of this thing, finally. The problem is, as we gear up for opening night, as Doug alluded to, we have been left out of almost everything. We have been fortunate to get the PPP. It's allowed me to keep my job, which I am very grateful for. It's allowed us to keep our coach employed, and that's allowed him to maintain relationships with players. So when October 15th rolls around, John and I don't have to throw on our helmets and go out there and play. That is good <laughs> news for everybody. We were left out of the business interruption grant, which hurt. Um, we were left out, Steam Wheelers, Tax Lawyer Center left out, our sister team in Peoria, <coughs> and admittedly, admittedly our rival team, uh, got $65,000. The Peoria baseball team got $150,000. Their arena got $150,000. So their arena actually had to end up giving it back. They were eligible, but Peoria got the business interruption grant program. We did not. We were also originally expecting to get around half a million dollars from the Shuttered Venue Grant Program. They kind of molded that to not take care of the sports teams. So we missed out on that as well. We were ineligible for the Downstate Small Business Stabilization Program, uh, and we've just been left out of the majority of initiatives out there, which is why we are asking um, for $164,000. That is a number that will let us get to the start of the season doing the things we need to do. Uh, we will be limping there very badly uh, without that. I want to leave you with a, a few other numbers. In our first season in seven five, seven, eights, if you will. We have given back just shy of a quarter of a million dollars to local nonprofits. We do that through our jersey auctions, donations, all different ways. Um, Doug really hit on something I think as well, quality of place. I'm only here because of the sports team. That's why I came to the Quad Cities to work for it. I have a ton of friends I have made who the Steam Wheelers, the Storm, the River Bandits, they are huge things that they love about living here. Uh, pride in community as well. Another thing Doug touched on, just having that logo, wearing it in airports, having people come up and ask it, who are they? That means a lot. Um, and lastly, the storm provides $25 million, according to Visit Quad Cities, and direct financial impact to the Quad City area. 
of the three sports teams were right around $60 million. We provide almost half of that. The River Bandits on the other side have gotten from the city of Davenport $5 million over the next 10 years for stadium renovations, and they have gotten $185,000 off their lease for the next 10 years um, just as that lifeline. That is a lot of money, and we are not expecting that. If you would like to give it to us, that is fantastic. <laughs> However, we know that there are a lot of businesses that need that support. So again, the 164,000 we are asking for is what we really need to get to the finish line. Like I said, we've had a staff of one for about a year. We just got our second back. We're gonna have a staff half the size. This would help us do the things we need to do to, uh, to get ready for a season in full. So with that, I'll turn it over to questions for any of us. And thank you again for the opportunity to come and speak tonight. Just to, to sum it up, um, so that's what uh, the ask is for. 100,000 for uh, restart money for for us. 217 for the team. 165 or for the uh, 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 steam wheelers. 165 for the storm, and then the outdoor project. The balance of 700 thousand dollars to try to bring that one home. We build something that uh, would really be terrific for the community. So, would it, does anybody have questions of any of us? Mr. O'Brien. Would these outdoor events be concurrent with events at the mark? Yeah, potentially, yeah. It would, potentially, it would so you wouldn't have it. to, like, cancel one to do the other? No, or, no. It, in fact, it would, people would go there before the show, and we try to end them early enough because there's a hotel right there. So, you know, I don't know whether it's 9 or 10 o'clock on a Friday or Saturday. It's good. That was my next question. <laughs> and you, you meant the Tax Slayer Center, right? Did I call it the Mark? Yes. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I do it sometimes. I'll, that won't be the first time I'll do that, right, too. But, yeah. um, <laughs> but also, this will be, uh, that's probably not to ask you, will this be in separate uh, motions to do this? Will they each be separated out? Is it going to be one big motion? Do we know? I think that's all up to uh, the council as it comes okay. to decision-making time. Right. We're not quite there yet with our process of examining all the ARP funding. Sure. Yep. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, Scott, thanks. Uh, I appreciate laying all this out. Um, you had mentioned about $6 million in capital uh, improvements. Uh, can you go into that a little bit? You still have $6 million or? But we spent... Um, over two million dollars just in, during the shutdown, right, yeah. um, and we spent 1.2 just on COVID remediation projects, like making automated flush valves, yeah, touchless. mobile ordering, touchless. Um, but yeah, we we always have a long-term capital plan as we go, and that's that's what's in our capital plan. It rolls year to year. So emergencies get moved up, and we use the money that's out of that we some of the money <coughs> generated from the amusement tax. There, there's a 5%, 3% goes towards that, that we basically are taxing ourselves because we're taxing the shows, not the people that come to them. We're taxing, taxing the promoters, and on most shows, we're partnering with the promoters. So it's money that comes out of settlement. And then um, the, uh, um, what was the other part of the questions? Well, I was just trying to understand the, the, the six million. Uh, so yeah, yeah the, the um, uh, the other, I'm sorry, the, the other part of our capital uh, investments get, gets paid for out of our reserves. And we're, we sh we're down to about um, uh, 1.4 million, I think it's, it's projected by September. It goes up and down. When I got here, it was, it was right around there, I believe, a little higher, but we've, we've had it up high, up 12 million, and we just, we, we keep, Every penny we make goes back into the building to keep it going, keep looking new. And um, it's something that most communities like ours don't have the, that luxury. Um, if you look at any any community that's got an arena of our size, it's it's a it, the, the city's paying a lot and the, it costs a lot to keep it going. But we've been very fortunate to have reserves and buildings paid for. We don't have debt service, and we every every penny goes back in. So if we if it runs out, then then we're gonna need help. So, so the 1.4 that's left over, is that after the that, capital improvements that you were talking about? No, no. So, so we have to prioritize the emergency once we need to do. We have to try to build our coffers back up as we reopen. You know, in a good year, like 
Some years it's been as much as uh, you know 1.8 million in profit that goes back into the reserves. Other other years it's been. The year before I got here was like a negative 40,000. Was the only time the building ever lost money. But then we were up to 1 million in um, uh, last year or the last full years before COVID. We're in the 500. Three to five, three is probably the lowest since I've been here, but probably averages. The average is probably about five to seven hundred a year in, in what we throw back into the pool. So uh, we don't need six months to do those things right away, but you know, equipment gets older, it breaks, you have to project those things. So, so that's our projections. Okay. Any other questions for our presenters? Yes, Mr. Wynn. Um, as far as, you know, Bass Street in, in this, what capacity wise, what's the, the differences of those? Are they it's pretty similar. comparable? Pretty much um, the same size. Pretty much. Uh, it's very similar square footage, um, uh, but I'm thinking like if we moved all the tables out and had if somebody that was bigger, you might get, you know, 1,500 people out there. But typically, just for sitting down having dinner and watching what's ever going on, you might be looking at 100 or 200 people, at, um, you know, on a weekend night. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining Thank us tonight. Thanks for your time. Mm -hmm. So we move to our agenda <laughs> items. The first one being rescinding a local state of emergency declaration. Okay, that would be me. <laughs> yes. Isn't that great? The first, the first action item that I get to report on is putting an end to something that they've almost put an end to all of us. <laughs> and that would be to repeal the resolution that put in place uh, the emergency orders by the former mayor and the former administration, and that was Resolution 1066-2020. Um, what we'd be looking for, uh, short and simple, is to have the uh, resolution rescinded and then uh, putting back in place normal operations based upon what has happened here uh, on the, based on the actions of Governor Pritzker and going uh, removing all the restrictions statewide. So we're just following suit in, sl in safe order and going forward with this repeal at this time. Any questions? Motion approved. Second. Motion to approve by Alderman Wendt, seconded by Alderman Schmidt. Any discussion? Yes, sir. Wendt, sorry, <laughs> took a minute. <laughs> uh, I, I was just looking across at, uh, uh, at Jeff over there. With the repeal of this, does this cause any issues? Because I know some of these emergency orders included a relaxing of um, cafe, uh, sidewalk dining, and, and those sorts of things. Um, are we going to run into any issues if we repeal this that it's going to cause any issues downtown? And I'm sorry I didn't ask this in advance. I didn't think about it until I was looking at you. I, I, I think we'll. Yeah, I, I don't think that. One it, of you want to answer? Yeah, I don't think that it, that it would. I mean, you're. Yeah. They're already out there. They're already. They already have their tables all set. I'm not sure what problem we would perceive. There are too many people on the sidewalks, or you know, I guess maybe I'm trying to understand the Thank question you. better, uh, Alderman. I, our our legal counsel can also answer. Yeah, because I wasn't here when you. <laughs> I, I would think that place. potentially with the motion that was brought forward once essentially the uh, outdoor dining opportunities were able to happen again that uh, Alderman Waldron. Uh, brought forward at the beginning of the outdoor dining season may and, and could potentially from depending on uh, the corporate council's legal interpretation be able to to be a kind of I, I guess compartmentalized away from from this agenda item potentially that, that'd be my, agree with that, that'd that's be my interpretation of it. come back yet though. let's how about we have Mar yes. Margaret weigh in uh, yeah right so he is correct so it will not interfere. Okay. Because okay. it was a separate motion. Or separate. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Separate as motion. long as that's okay. compartmentalized, I'm, I'm good. Everyone understands yeah. we're, we are able to keep sidewalk dining. Right. Um, Don't want the unintended consequences. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. So that was part of our you know, delay in, because there were a number of orders that occurred and some expired on their own. And then some, you know, were done separate like that one. So
so it was kind of a jigsaw puzzle. Yes, Mr. Wynn. Do we know which other ones, if this one is compartmentalized, are there others that are still, well, or can you let us know by next time? Marty may know. Yes, Mr. Von Ex. I, I believe in April this council passed a resolution keeping those sidewalk cafes open okay. for the duration of the summer. So we'd have to go back and look at that. I remember but I that as well. There's no other compartmentalization okay. of any other um, things that we've been doing. So. Okay. Good to know. That was my recollection. Mm -hmm. Anything else? All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, that motion passes. Number two, okay. surrounding property owner consent, 1209 Fourth Avenue. We turn to Mr. Vitas or Ms. Parr. Which one is this? This is the uh, liquor consent surrounding property. Sure. Um, Three Brothers Hospitality LLC, <coughs> you can see, is doing business as Poor Brothers uh, Craft Tap Room. <laughs> They're looking for a Class B liquor license, and they have to have approval from the surround, according to the ordinance, they have to have approval from the surrounding property owners. Uh, one of which is the city, and I believe there are two other property owners who are affected, but we don't anticipate that there would be any issue uh, based on communications that have happened with them. So they are looking for your approval at this point so that they can go forward with their plans to uh, establish their outdoor seating area. Move to approve. There's a motion by Alderman Went. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Alderman Timian. Any discussion? Yes, Mr. Wynn. I, I assume we haven't heard anything, because I think there's maybe two other uh, property owners in that circle, I think, and maybe one of them's the hotel I, through the thing. Have we heard anything from them? No, and they didn't Positive anticipate any issue, but they have not returned those two forms yet. Okay. But three of the five were city properties, so they needed at least one oh, yeah. you know, consent from the mm -hmm. city. So does that yes, mean by Mr. Schmidt? I'm sorry. No problem. <laughs> does that mean by approving that we would be basically we're signing off on it? Even if they objected, we'd be moving it forward. That's what I was asking. Yes. Anything else? All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, that motion passes. We do have another tonight. Um, and I will invite um, Mr. Manis to the podium to share a little bit about something I think he's um, passed out to us, Avenue Flags Project. And I, I first want to say, you know, back in May when we um, okayed the purchase of the brackets and poles to, to make flags on River Drive accessible, it was always my hope that we could get someone to um, help us with American flags for 4th of July, Memorial Day, Labor Day, all these important um, dates. And so I am pleased to turn the microphone over to Mr. Manis to talk about how that might happen. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Oh, Your Honor. Your Honor. Yes. One Sorry, second, Jeff. Mr. Schmidt. Um, I'm a member of Optimist International, so I will be recusing myself from this. <laughs> okay, thank you. And Mr. Wentz. Ditto. 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 All right. <laughs> Two members oh. recusing themselves. Right, let me thank crunch you. the numbers here. Real quick. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, on a serious note, thank you, Your Honor, and thank you to the honorable members of City Council for this opportunity to stand at the podium and, and talk about, um, I guess, what's next for uh, the flagpole brackets along River Drive. Uh, we are approximately eight days and four or five hours away from uh, the end of Pride Month. Um, it, it was, um, as I had followed along through your guys, through city council's uh, 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 action to, to uh, install the, uh, the pride flags um, through uh, the month of June for, for pride month, um, I immediately had visions of, okay, so the infrastructure for um, the hanging of the flags, such as a pride flag, uh, will be in place uh, throughout that, that corridor along River Drive. And I immediately be began to, to brainstorm as to how we could continue to utilize those. Um, because now the, the, the flagpole br brackets were um, ultimately installed through that piece of very simple infrastructure for, for, for downtown only, but important uh, uh, infrastructure. Um, uh, it, 
undoubtedly adds uh, a level of vibrancy and uh, design aesthetic appeal to, to, to that incredibly important, arguably the most important uh, corridor um, in, in the Quad Cities that the Quad Cities has to offer. So, um, uh, and I'd like to certainly go on record to, to, to thank you all for, for the opportunity to have uh, the community, Moline, uh, my hometown, and, and the city I, I work for, to have those flags displayed through, throughout the, uh, the uh, uh, month of June for Pride Month. It made me very, very proud of, of, of my community. Um, so it, to that point, as I work through, uh, I guess, the brainstorming aspects of process uh, of what to do, um, I immediately um, uh, thought of the Avenue of the Flags project that is uh, facilitated by the uh, Breakfast Optimist Club. Uh, it's a wonderful program uh, that has been installing uh, uh, American flags both in residential properties and uh, private uh, uh, business properties, as well as there was a time that there were um, 100 of them in, uh, installed along um, uh, Ben Butter Butterworth Parkway um, to, to reach out to them for, for partnership. Uh, the, the initial conversation points that I've had with them have been very favorable. Uh, they meet on Wednesdays. They're actually going to be meeting tomorrow morning to, to discuss the uh, potential of, of collaborating with the city to ultimately install um, their American flags um, in some of the specifics are to be determined, and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to working with the city's corporate council to, to I guess, bake into the specifics of a you know, a potential uh, memorandum, memorandum of, of understanding to to ultimately uh, enter into what I believe would be a genuine, uh, mutually beneficial uh, partnership with the uh, Breakfast Optimist Club to install flags sometime in the spring um, until, you know, potentially like, let's say Labor Day, right around Labor Day, um, throughout, uh, you know, that outdoor flag season. I think the winter could be a little bit harsh for, for American flags, and it's, it's, and it's important to honor and respect them. So, you know, the, they would be essentially like what I would say fair weather flags through through the uh, outdoor flag season. Uh, so I would uh, um, certainly uh, open it up for, for, for questions um, from, you know, council's perspective as to how, um, as, as staff, you would like to proceed, but essentially to, to kind of wrap up, my staff recommendation uh, here tonight would be to look for approval to potentially work with the Breakfast Op Optimist Club to come up with a situation to enter into a mutually beneficial uh, uh, partnership with them that would support the organization, and their primary function is to help out the needy children in the community. Um, to then also turn around and add a design element of American flags to, to downtown Moline, not to exceed $2,000 annually. I make a motion to approve that seems reasonable. I see there are flags everywhere. My neighborhood looks awesome, and you wake up, they're all up there. It just looks great. And we have those brackets, too. I mean, yeah, that, that's a yeah, motion to Second. Uh, approve. Okay, so, so then our clerk has the wording very clearly oh, your, yeah. your motion to approve as i'm going to sort of reiterate what he yes. said to, uh, to not expend more than two thousand dollars on a mutually beneficial partnership to have their flags displayed all right so is we that, have, thank you all the is that clear enough <laughs> how all can right. i polish it <laughs> so we've yeah. got a motion from mr macias and was there a second i heard second, second from mr o'brien um discussion Yes, Mr. Uh, Timmy. Will these be, uh, will the Optimist Club be responsible for installing and removing these flags from the flagpoles? Uh, they are undoubtedly uh, open to, to, to that uh, possibility. Um, our uh, city staff individual, uh, uh, Mr. Josh Whiting, um, who is our city electrician, it would, would also be willing to help if, if that's, um, I guess, the policy in terms of the implement, implementation of this flag project in downtown Moline uh, that, that uh, council would see. But the uh, Avenue of the Flags project has a really large volunteer right. workforce that, that would really enjoy the opportunity. I just, I wonder from a liability standpoint, if the city should be responsible for installing or... The city answer is yes. That would be my advice. <laughs> okay. yes. We could have them 
kind of labor, but we're probably better off for, you know, damage purposes and whatnot. Have our staff do that. Okay. Yes, Thank you. Mr. O'Brien. What do we do with the pride flags? Did the city install the, those? We, Yes. We did those, we yeah. We own them. And they'll, they'll be stored after this right. month, right? So. And it, it would be, in my understanding, or, you know, as I think about the logistics of, of, of taking down the pride flags, which we own, um, while that's happening simultaneously, um, uh, city staff could, in the boom truck bucket, um, have the American flags ready to go to, 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 to plant those just as soon as the pride flags come down. Um, so then my question would be what uh, this the number of two thousand dollars you know that we would want we would say in this motion is to make this happen right Certainly. that would account for the installation that we would pay that would it would cost to have our staff help with that at, while they're taking down the other flags but then also for the purchase of, or rental of the flags from the Optimist Club? Uh, yeah, depending on how we want to define, uh, I, I guess, our uh, use of, of the flags, whether it's mm -hmm. uh, what could be considered like a lease or licensing agreement where we, 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 we temporarily own the flags. Um, well, I suppose we already did vote, like we've already planned to spend the money to take them down since we voted to take spend the money to put them up. So in this particular case, this year, we're covered in that sense. But I think as you work out an agreement, we want to be mindful of that piece of it. And, and I guess I would like to say we should probably be very clear, we're talking about this year, that there could be other options where other people want to sponsor that next year for the city, or they want to donate the flags as a gift, as we had the other flags donated. I, I think we have to maybe take one year at a time, or at least try to do it for this year, and then see how we can plan ahead for next year. Does that make sense? Yes, Mr. Waldron. Margaret, one of the nuances we talked about with the last special interest group was that we wanted those uh, flags to be donated, and they were donated, then we installed them. I, obviously, the American flag is different than a special interest group. Do you have any issues with that, that these should be donated? And I, I understand you can do an MOU to make a lease or whatever they're talking about, but do you have any viability legal issues related to not um, donating them? So my concern is that we purchase from. Um, <clears throat> I don't know this uh, group um, or whether that could raise issues that were sponsoring their missions. Um, I do have some concern about that, but again, I have not thought it through. Um, I did not hear about this until yeah. and we right now. apologize for that, Margaret, that um, it came no. to us this afternoon. <laughs> um, I, I do see American flags as totally different. So um, they clearly represent our country and you know, that is different than their groups interests. Um, and, and I would like a, to make a point uh, in reference to um, and specifically the uniqueness of the, the Breakfast op Optimist group. Uh, they hand make these flags, which I think separates them out from ultimately, of course, going on Amazon and, and, and buying flags. It kind of, it, it, I guess it, in my staff perspective, creates a sole proprietorship that they're providing a service to the community that you would not be able to find anywhere else in the Quad Cities, well, potentially. Well, we do acquire flags pretty regularly, you know, here and other. One right outside. Yeah. 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 Number of them, actually. Um, so in that regard, it's probably no 
Sure. Yes, Mr. Moyer. Um, thank you. Is it is it our intent to get these flags up then before July 4th? Yeah. So we'll, we'll need I to did. vote in the council meeting as well? Or um, will this? I, I checked. Then, because what Margaret, I'm what, please. <laughs> what I'm wondering is if we can just say, if we can, if we can approve it just contingent upon them working it out. Yeah, that's what right. would be yeah. the idea. Yeah. You know what? We could ratify on the 13th. Okay. Okay, yeah. Uh, I knew there was like a sometime. I don't know that this is non pro tone, but you're saying go. ratifying later exactly. is a way to yeah. to help us get it up in an appropriate time, and then also have it done uh, with enough o oversight from you. So, are we clear on what we're asking um, so. through this motion? The motion is: nope. Would you repeat it? Do you have questions, comments? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we, did, we did talk about we had, it. With, we had a, we did have a brief, a very brief meeting, uh, the mayor and I and Jeff, and, and so that so that you're as clear as I was. I mean, we would be buying the flags from the Optimist Club. The two thousand dollars goes toward these handmade flags, correct? You know, if I'm wrong anywhere, just let me know. We'd buy it from them. We were reusing the poles that we have, so we're not really buying new poles, correct? It, they have. Uh, Poles that they would also that be able fit, to help provide that fit into the standard that we have attached today. So it's the poles and the flags that would be, and there's 30 of them total. Uh, 30, yes. And that 30 is covered by the $2,000 that would be supporting the Optimist Club's efforts since they hand make them. I mean, it's kind of an interesting rela relationship, you know, made, produced locally and then displayed locally, and then our resources to acquire them then are used locally to support their hunger programs for the children, needy, ch needy families. Mr. That's, that's Timian. That's how I see it. Uh, just for clarification, are we talking about purchasing them or leasing them? Purchase. Because I, I heard mis mi uh, administrators say purchase. I uh, my understanding purchase. was no, this is using the, they put them up, or, or it's their property, it's we're just leasing them. Properties. The goal is going to be to work with Corporate Council as we continue so to bring to together this MOU to um, uh, align it and, and bake in, uh, uh, I, I guess, uh, the wording and the language that, that uh, uh, falls in line with city policy in terms of purchasing. So I think in your motion, it should be to Purchase or receive a donation okay. of American flags because, frankly, I'm not sure which is a better route to go. Um, so, you can amend your motion. Okay. <laughs> uh, but it, it, can I ask uh, also, but doesn't this group like take their flags down and store them themselves? So yeah, it's kind of like a traditionally reason. with, with, yeah, with, with the partnerships they uh, or so how what would we call them? Yeah, yeah. I think we'll work, work it, out. it out. Yeah, we'll work it yeah. out. Okay. I think if if Mr. Manis has the guidance that we want to have American mm -hmm. flags up, right, Buy and that this group is a group that can do it quickly for us, um, and that our preference would be to purchase or have them be donated. Right, and that's in line with okay. what we yes. we're doing. Then those are the guidelines, and it has to all be less than two thousand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then that's the guidelines you can go and talk to them about tomorrow at, at the meeting that you were informed about. And if that does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then it. I know. That's <laughs> <laughs> yep. fine. Yeah. We'll work it out. Okay. So you're gonna amend your motion. So I'm going to amend my motion that we purchase or receive as a donation these flags and not spend less than two thousand dollars, and we'll figure out you, you two will figure out the details so that not more than two thousand dollars. Not, not more than two thousand. Not more than two thousand dollars. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> not no, more than two thousand dollars. Um, and that would be from the. Breakfast Optimist, Optimist Club. Optimist Club. Right. And I'll so, second the amended motion. And you'll motion. second the amended motion. <laughs>
any further discussion, and I, I guess I'll just put out there again, very short notice today. Um, uh, we don't have a meeting next week. The holiday is upon us. You said eight days away, or oh my gosh, is it really eight days away? It's pretty close, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so it is crazy, but it's a great thing for our community, and, and so I, I personally believe so. I appreciate staff's willingness to work it out on behalf of everyone um, with those guidelines in, involved. And of course, as we continue to administratively work through this in, 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 in the months and years to come, we'll, the, the, the goal is going to be to, to maintain the diligence to come to all of you uh, much more in advance as, as we continue to yeah. implement this design element to downtown only. That sounds great. So I will call, ask for a roll call vote because it has to do with uh, money expenditure at, at some point, <laughs> potentially. Alderman Macias? Aye. Went? Abstain. Timian? Aye. Moyer? Aye. O'Brien? Aye. Waldron? Aye. Schmidt? Abstain. Williams? Aye. Six ayes, two abstentions. That motion passes. Thank you, sir. We'll look forward to an update. Thank you, Thank Your you. Honor. Do we have any public comment tonight? All right, hearing none, we'll close out our Committee of the Whole and move to our regular meeting. Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Alderman Macias, do you have an invocation? No, no. Thank you. Roll call, please. Alderman Williams? Present. Parker? Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I have a moment. <laughs> Macias? Present. I thought I would not do that. <laughs> Wentz? Present. Timian? Present. Moyer? Present. O'Brien? Present. Waldron? Present. Schmidt? Present. Your Honor, I request approval of Committee of the Whole Council and Executive no, no, no. Session minutes of June 15th, 2021, and appointments made during Committee of the Whole on June 22nd, 2021. Resolutions. Council Bill 1145-2021, a resolution authorizing the Mayor and City Clerk to execute and attest to a business and economic growth partnership agreement between the City of Moline, Illinois, and the Quad Cities Chamber to enable more collaboration and efficient relationships with this that facilitate business growth and investment in our city. Council Bill 1146-2021, a resolution authorizing the Fleet and Facilities Manager to purchase an Altec Model AT48M articulating telescopic aerial device with a fiberglass upper boom and fiberglass insulator in the articulating arm with Altec Industries Incorporated for the amount of $167,823. Council Bill 1147-2021, a resolution authorizing the Fleet and Facilities Manager to purchase a ProPatch Model HL 425-80 DHER with HD Industries Incorporated for the amount of $82,819. Council Bill 1148-2021, a resolution authorizing the approval of a quote from Davenport Electric Contract Company for materials and installation of traffic signal modifications at 23rd Street and River Drive for the amount of $23,776. Council Bill 1149-2021, a resolution authorizing the mayor and city clerk to execute and attest to a licensing and concession agreement between the city of Moline and Little Stevie's Taste of Something LLC <laughs> to sell food and beverages from a mobile, mobile food unit at the Northeast parking lot of Stevens Park from July 17, 2021 through July 16, 2023, as weather permits and at the city's sole discretion and authorizing city staff to do any and all things necessary to fulfill the terms of the licensing and concession agreement. Council Bill 1150-2021, a resolution authorizing the mayor and city clerk to execute and to attest to a contract with in situ form Technologies USA LLC for project number 1356-2021 sewer lining program for the amount of $299,292.80. Move to approve the consent agendas numbers two through six. Second. Um, he and needs, yet, he needs yes, to and we need one, to so. uh, 
point of order or clarification, <laughs> or Mr. Macias, you need to. I, I need to recuse myself from uh, item number one. So we'll vote on two through six. And then yes, okay. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, which item number one? Yes. Two, yeah, two, so through, two six through six right now. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, Mr. Went. Did I, I must have just not heard you say, did you, you said that when you moved to, yeah, made the motion two through six. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. All right, so we're clear that motion, we've had one motion. Did we have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Timian. Roll call, please. Alderman Macias? Aye. Went? Aye. Timian? Aye. Moyer? Aye. O'Brien? Aye. Waldron? Aye. Schmidt? Aye. Williams? Aye. Eight eyes, no nays? Move to approve uh, Council uh, Resolution 1145-2021. Second. Just moved by Mr. Went, seconded by Alderman Timian. Roll call, please. Alderman Macias. Excuse myself. Or just say abstain. Or abstain. Alderman Went. Uh, aye. Timian. Aye. Moyer. Aye. O'Brien. Aye. Waldron. Aye. Schmidt. Aye. Williams. Aye. Seven ayes, one abstention. And that motion carries. Your Honor, before we go on, can I have a question, please? Yes. Tony, Council Bill Resolution 1150-2021, when did that come to committee? I don't remember that last Can I last answer week. Yes, uh, our clerk will answer that question. I asked her that earlier on. That was one of those items that we discussed that if it was already approved as part of the budget, it would go directly onto the consent agenda. And then you can always ask for that to be removed to the non-consent if you'd like to have discussion. Okay. It might be nice to designate that somehow, because how would one know unless one looks back? The one way that I was doing that was including the council action report. Normally you won't see council action reports attached to the council agenda, but I do attach it if it's one of those types of items because it's the first time you see it and you need that memo. Thank Does you. that could, help? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Could could we do it somewhere on the face? Because I think it'd be easy if it's on the first two pages rather than having to hunt down through and sure. figure if it is or isn't. So I'll talk with Margaret about that. Yeah. And we'll figure out a, a way to designate that. Thanks. Uh, nine consent agenda first reading ordinances. Council Bill forty oh five dash twenty twenty one. A special ordinance authorizing the mayor and city clerk to execute and attest to an economic incentive and tax increment allocation financing redevelopment agreement between the city of Moline and NextGen Development Corporation and to execute any necessary agreements referenced therein and authorizing all appropriate city officers and staff to do all things necessary to complete each of the city's responsibilities pursuant to said agreement. Yeah. And that is all I have this evening, Your Honor. Yes, Mr. I move Wendt. for consideration of a special ordinance uh, 4005 2021. Second. All right, that um, council bill has been motioned and seconded for consideration. Discussion. Yes, Mr. Wendt. Uh So uh, I, I moved to, uh, to do the consideration on this for a couple of reasons. One, I wanted to just get some clarification. Uh, we had some discussion last time about. Uh, facade and and how this was developed and I think we've got some additional information that I think would be good for uh, the council regarding uh, the facade so um, mayor who was the second on that one Mr. Mr. Mayor. thank you mm -hmm. thank you I have three <laughs> I'm uh, Justin with Next End Development. Mm -hmm. um, appreciate your guys' time. I typed up a little a spreadsheet of what uh, my anticipated cost for facade was. Um, I know there's been some discussion on what exactly facade is in this project. Um, so I'm hoping this clarifies a little bit of uh, what I'm committing to do on this building and Moving forward, what I'm, what I'm trying to get after. 
Sure. I've also included, um, I put the window quotes in there just so you guys can see that, you know, I'm not bluffing. This is a, a, it's a very big purchase for me and that doesn't even include, I gotta get old windows out, I gotta put new windows in. Um, there's some information in there. It's a three-story building. I gotta get equipment to even get there. So also not cheap. So just a few details. I hope that will help clarify uh, some of my requests, I guess, so. Well, thank you very much. I, I appreciate that. I think that clears up a, a lot of uh, the discussion. And so with that, because of um, material costs and everything that's going and that we're not actually meeting again until July 13th, uh, just so everybody who's maybe new to the council, if two thirds of us agree to uh, consider, we can actually then vote to approve this tonight and get them moving on it. So uh, that's why I made the motion to uh, consider and I hope uh, you guys will support that. Any other comments? Yes, Mr. O'Brien. I think uh, this looks like 116000 That was like a lot of money on facade. I will say that. I don't know. I know materials are expensive now. So I uh, just, my, uh, this is my first building, my first project. So I know the my building has two facades, and I would say it's probably three times bigger than the average facade <laughs> okay. in downtown because I do have, you know, my normal, but it's all sort of the side of the street. So there's 30 some windows and yeah. it needs just I want to clean it up and make it look good thank you okay any other comments or questions yes mr. Williams I'll second that motion it, it was seconded by I then I won't <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna third it okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right so hearing no more discussion <clears throat> or questions uh, roll call please I'm gonna make you vote last Alderman Macias <laughs> aye Wentz? Aye. Timian? Aye. Moyer? Aye. O'Brien? Aye. Waldron? Aye. Schmidt? Aye. Williams? Aye. Eight ayes, no nays. So uh, move to approve the uh, development agreement. Is there a second? Motion to approve from- Second. Yes. Uh, motion by Alderman Went, seconded by Alderman Williams. Any further discussion? Looking forward to it. All right, roll call please. Alderman Macias? Aye. Went? Aye. Timian? Aye. Moyer? Aye. O'Brien? Aye. Waldron? Aye. Schmidt? Aye. Williams? Aye. Eight ayes, no names. And then motion passed. Okay, we are to miscellaneous business. Mr. Williams? Nothing, Your Honor. Mr. Macias? Nothing, Your Honor. Mr. Went? Nothing, Your Honor. Mr. Timian? Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I have a statement I'd like to read just because it's a little long and I don't want to wing it. So um, as many of you know, I'm a, I'm a bicyclist, and I originally uh, hoped to come here tonight to talk about uh, the Quad City's fourth bicycle death in the last uh, seven to eight weeks. Um, and this accident occurred just a few streets away from where I was cycling that same morning. Uh, but then yesterday, while I was riding, I was struck by a car. And um, I was extremely lucky. I was bruised, sore, my bicycle needs a lot of work but I walked away. Um, an extra foot or two, and I would not have been as fortunate. Um, but this is not the first time that I've been hit by a vehicle while riding to or from Ben Butterworth Parkway, and I suspect it will not be the last. Um, and I also know that my experience is not unique. Uh, these type of incidents often go unreported and are therefore unlikely to be factored into the uh, local statistics. As long as there are no uh, major injuries or property damage, police reports are rarely filed. And as a result, the drivers are sometimes not held accountable and the cyclists are effectively ignored. Uh, the Quad Cities area has about 380,000 people. And in the last, I guess now eight weeks, we've had um, four fatalities. This might seem like a small number, but when you compare us to Chicago with 2.7 million people, they average six uh, fatalities a year. And so the question is, what's the difference between us and them that they have such a low number per population? And it's, uh, it's multifaceted, of course, there's no silver bullet, but uh, Chicago has the infrastructure to accommodate alternative modes of transportation, and the drivers in Chicago have learned how to coexist with cyclists and pedestrians. Uh, these issues uh, are not only preventable in Moline, but 
the city has planned on addressing them for years. Uh, we have a bikeways plan. It's, the engineering's done, but we lack the staff to implement it. We have bicycle lanes, but they are disconnected and sporadic. I fear that we've mistaken our own inaction with prudence. And we assume that by taking our time on issues like this, we get the best and cheapest possible result, but we oftentimes end up with neither. Uh, I, I'm urging the council to um, use this opportunity to make Moline livable. And by livable, I mean a city that is drivable, walkable, and bikeable. A city where people can ride their bikes to work, walk to their neighborhood restaurant, uh, and drive like they normally do. Right now, Moline is mostly only drivable. Uh, some neighborhoods lack sidewalks. Other neighborhoods have sidewalks, but they're unsafe. We lack actual bicycle lanes. The easiest way to attract and retain residents is by promoting safety, and that starts with the very sidewalks and roads that we use every day. Um, I wanna just reiterate that our roads can be very scary on a bicycle. As if you're not in a car and if you don't believe me, I urge all of you to ride your bike to city council meeting next week. Um, I ask you to ride your bike to the store or even down to the parkway from your home. And it, it, can, be, it can be often frightening. Uh, I will be meeting with uh, the city administrator uh, later this week and, and we'll be discussing this further and I will be uh, having meetings with local um, uh, members of the community and organizations that wanna promote this as well. And I would urge, again, the council to stop making excuses for an action and, and to look for solutions for this kind of problem. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Wood. Um, I, I just want to uh, reiterate uh, uh, what uh, Alderman uh, Timian had said. It, I've been on council now for six years and have been, as you guys know, have been really pushing, trying to get this bikeways plan in place. Um, it is something that we have been working on. Uh, and when we talk about staff, I encourage Bob that we, when we hire staff, we hire staff that actually will implement policy. I, I've got an email right here of a former staff member that led that department that specifically said, we just did that to appease people. It was perfunctory. We weren't really going to implement it, but it was a policy of the, mm -hmm. of the council. And so it was fighting against entrenched ideas old school engineering that we was actually was fighting against what the council wanted. And so I, I couldn't agree with you more. And that's why uh, when it comes to hiring and moving forward, getting the right people in place that is willing to uh, implement the policies that this council wants to. Um, we, we do have a, a map now that shows uh, Alderman Moyer and I w have been worked on it of where we were three years ago, which was basically Kiwanis and, and Ben Butterworth, and where we are and the, the grants and things that we have in place to start to build that network. It's not enough, it's not fast enough, but with the resources we have, it, it, it is moving in that right direction. And, and I appreciate uh, your, uh, um, your candor on this, and sorry you got uh, hit, but uh, we, we are moving in the right direction, and, and I appreciate you uh, pushing this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Timian. Nothing Mr. Moore? Okay. Mr. O'Brien? I would uh, appreciate what Alderman Timian said, too. I think it also reduces our carbon footprint. More yep. people ride bicycles. I'm probably not going to ride one, but, you know, more people, <laughs> ride, the more people that ride bicycles, less wear and tear on the roads. Exactly. It makes our roads look It could last longer. Right. This guy's a runner. <laughs> yeah. Um, I got a question. It seems like, and I, I'm hesitant to say this, but it seems like the the fireworks are a little bit less than they were last year. I'm still hearing them, but they're so, I mean, the way they've been upgraded, they're so loud now, it could be at East Moline. I mean, I don't know. I'm just curious. This is about East Moline. <laughs> uh, have you had, I mean, have you had a lot of calls or as a police and, and fire, has a fire had ambulance calls? For use of fireworks. That's my knowledge. Okay. Uh, I will have to look up the call number. But okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Waldron. Nothing, Your Honor. Mr. Schmidt. Nothing, Your Honor. All right. Then it's to me. I uh, just wanted to let you know that today, uh, as I said on the transportation committee of the bi-state um, committee, 
we did get an update from George Ryan about I-74, and just everything's on time. So we should be, you know, they'll gradually yeah, yeah, yeah. be opening yeah. things up um, as we go here and, and be on time to open up by the end of the year. Um, we did host Mr. Macias and um, Mr. Staff, Mr. Von Oggs and KJ Whitley, uh, a listening host last night uh, at the Ontiveros Teen Center. Was nicely attended, smaller group, but very engaged. We got some similar feedback um, that we've been hearing, so we'll continue to compile that. I'm starting to talk about the, the chart that I gave you all, right, as three baskets of information that we'll be pulling together and working together to get a timeline put together for when we actually have to make decisions. We still have not received the ARP first um, disbursement of the ARP funds yet, correct? Right. You got to. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> um, so anyway, encourage you to keep asking people to take the survey, take some copies with you. We are getting responses on those as well, so that's helpful. Um, and just to let you know, tomorrow I will be initiating um, formally the, the, the one of the baskets on that, the regional conversation. I have had good conversations one-on-one -on -one with some other city leaders um, in the area. Um, getting great ideas and and so just so you know where that's a lunchtime conversation that I've invited um, local mayors and finance directors and uh, city administrators to to see where everyone is at um, and see what kinds of priorities are rising to the top for other cities um, and I will compile all that and share it with you so anything from staff I have nothing mr. Galt you have something for us? Well, Alderman uh, O'Brien's intuition is, uh, looks to be very good. Uh, <laughs> last year, from June 1st to uh, the same day today, the 22nd, we had 114 calls. We've only had 45 in, uh, this year. So I'm not a math major. Somebody has to do the percentage for me on that. <laughs> Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, we're not we're not quarantined this year like we were last. <laughs> uh, certainly, it is uh, looks to be better. Um, you know, last year was uh, a little bit of an anomaly. I, I'm hopeful that uh, so many people home in the quarantine and, and doing their own fireworks. So, I guess my ask to you would be that you could encourage all of your residents and your wards to attend the largest fireworks display from Chicago to Denver. Uh, right here uh, in River City on July 3rd at 9.30 p.m. Uh, the two barges that shoot off a red, white, and boom uh, visible from Moline as well as you could catch the uh, East Moline uh, probably down by the, the tax layer. So, um, you know, from the police department standpoint, uh, this is a difficult uh, uh, annoyance and, uh, and obviously state law violation to enforce. Um, and so compliance is our number one goal here, is if you could get the Absolutely. message out on the uh, platforms that you have, we'll, we will be starting uh, messaging on Monday uh, to try to get that out, uh, to get compliance for um, either a reduced time frame. you know, if we can get people to end anything by 10 p.m., that obviously helps. But you will get complaints, we will get complaints. Um, it was outrageous last year, we had uh, over our, a hundred and um, we had 177 calls uh, in that weekend around 4th of July last year and we usually average uh, somewhere around <laughs> 70 to 100 in that that time period so um, you know it was a 14 percent increase uh, over uh, last year and then we had an enormous amount of regular police calls we actually were uh, inundated with police and fireworks calls um, that whole uh, that whole weekend. So this will be a tough weekend for us. Is uh, obviously on a on a weekend um, with Fourth of July, as you know, is, and it's good, people are going to be out. So we have a lot of challenges ahead. We will have uh, extra patrols out on uh, on the weekend of Fourth of July, uh, both to address fireworks complaints as well as. Uh, probably the increased activity that we'll have. So we hope that everybody celebrates safely. Um, if not, the fire chief will be around with his team uh, to clean up the mess. But we certainly hope that everybody um, celebrates safely. Uh, hope that you could advocate for us for compliance is what we're looking for. Okay. Thank you so much, Chief Galt. 
Okay, any public comment this evening? Hearing none, I believe we do have executive session. Your Honor, I make a motion that the council convene an executive session for the purpose of discussion of pending probable or imminent litigation 5 ILCS 120 slash 2 C11 and appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees 5 ILCS 120 slash 2 C1. Second. Motion by Alderman Williams, seconded by Alderman Went. Roll call, please. Alderman Macias? Aye. Went? Aye. Timian? Aye. Moyer? Aye. O'Brien? Aye. Waldron? Aye. Schmidt? Aye. Williams? Aye. Eight eyes, no nays. And that motion passes. If we could have everyone clear in the room, I think they did. Mm -hmm. <laughs>